witnessed around 12.30 a.m. by several St. Patrick Day revelers leaving a party near the museum. The two men were disguised as police officer, officers and parked in a hatchback on Palace Road, about 100 feet or 30 meters from the side of the entrance. The witness believed them to be policemen. The museum guards on duty that night were Rick Abath, age 23, and Randy Henstand, age 25. Abath was a regular night watchman, but March 18th was Headstand's first time in night shift, on night shift. The museum's security policy required that one guard would patrol the galleries with a flashlight and walkie-talkie, while the other would sit at the security desk. When a bath took the first patrol, fire alarms sounded in several rooms, but he could not locate any fire or smoke. He returned to the security room where the fire alarm control panel indicated smoke in multiple rooms. He assumed that some kind of malfunction had occurred and disabled the panel before returning to his patrol. Before completing his rounds, a bath stepped at the side entrance of the museum, briefly opening the side door and shouldn't again without informing Hestand. Abath returned to the security desk around 1 a.m. and Hestand assumed patrol duties. At 1.20 a.m. the thieves drove to the side entrance, parked, and walked to the side door. They ran the buzzer which connected them to Abath through an intercom. They explained they were police, police investigating a disturbance and they must be admitted. Abath could see them on the closed circuit television, wearing what appeared to be police uniforms. He was not aware of any disturbance, but he surmised that a St. Patrick's Day revelator may have climbed over the fence, causing someone to report to the police. A bath admitted the man, the men at 124. The, the thieves first entered a locked foyer that separated the side door from the museum. They approached a bath at the security desk. They asked if anyone was in the mu else was in the museum. A bath radioed at stand to return to the security desk. Around this time, a bath noticed the tallest man must judge appeared to be fake. The shorter man told a bath he looked familiar. They may have a warrant for his arrest. Demanding that a man emerge from behind the desk to provide identification. A bath complied, leaving the desk that contained the museum's only panic button to alert police. The shorter man forced a bath against the wall, spread his legs, and handcuffed him. His stand walked in the room around this time, and the taller thief turned towards him and handcuffed him. With bow guards handcuffed, the thieves revealed their true intentions to rob the museum and asked that the, the guards do not cause any problems. The thieves wrapped duct tape around the hands and eyes of the guards. Without asking for direction, they led the guards into the basement where the guards were handcuffed to a steam pipe and workbench. The thieves examined the guards' wallets and threatened them if they knew where the guards lived and told them if they would not inform authorities, they would receive a reward in, in about a year. It took the thieves less than 15 minutes to subdue the guards, which they completed at about 1.35 a.m. So, stealing the works, the thieves' movements were recorded on infrared motion detectors. Steps in the first room, they entered the Dutch room on the second floor, were not recorded until 1.48 a.m. This was th 13 minutes after they had finished subduing the guards, perhaps waiting to ensure the police had not been alerted. As the thieves approached the paintings in the Dutch room, a sensor sounded that was intended to alert when patrons moved too close to the artworks, and the thieves smashed the device. They removed the storm on the Sea of Cali, and a lady and gentleman in black from the wall and threw them on the marble floor, shattering their glass frame. Using a blade, they cut out the canvases out of their stretchers. They also removed a large Rembrandt self-portrait oil painting from the wall, but left it leaning against a cabinet. Investigators believe that the thieves may have considered it too large to transport, potentially because it had been painted, having painted on water. 
Jones for a frame displaying a no Napoleonic flag, likely an effort to steal the flag. They appear to have abandoned the effort as some screws were not removed, and they ultimately took the only took only the exposed eagle, who now atop the flagpole. They also took five to cast sketches from the room. The last work stolen was Shay Dordoni from the Blue Room on the first floor. The museum's motion detector did not detect any motion within the Blue Room during the thief's time in the building. The only footsteps detected in the room were Bats during the two times when he passed through the gallery on his earlier patrol. As they prepared to leave, the thieves, the guard, the thieves checked in on the guards and asked if they were comfortable. The thieves then moved to the security director's office where they took the video cassettes that contained evidence of the entrance from the closed circuit cameras as well as the data printouts of the motion detecting equipment. The movement data was also detected on a hard drive which remained untouched. The frame for Shea Tortoni uh, was left at the security director's desk. The thieves then began to remove the artwork from the museum. The side entrance door at 2.40 a.m. and again for the last time at 2.45 a.m. The robbery lasted 81 minutes. The next guard shift arrived. Later in the morning they realized something was amiss. When they could not establish contact with anyone inside for admittance, they called the security director entered the building with his keys and found nobody at the watch desk before calling the police. The police searched the building and found the guard still bound in the basement. So all about the thir stolen artworks, 13 works were stolen. In 1990, the FBI estimated the value of the theft at $200 million and raised the estimate to $500 million by 2000. It is considered the highest value museum robbery in history. So now it's going to all be about the early lead and like the suspects who possibly could have done it and there are a lot. So early leads and people of interest. The FBI took immediate control of the case in the grounds that the artwork could likely cross states, state lines. Investigators have called the case unique for its lack of strong physical evidence. It is known it is unknown if the thieves left DNA evidence, although fingerprints and footprints were found at the scene. It could not be concluded whether they were from the thieves or museum employees. The guards and witnesses in the street described one thief about 5'9", 1.75 meters, to 5'10", 1.78 meters in his late 30s with medium build and the other one as 6 feet at 1.83 meters to 61 1.85 meters in his early 30s with a heavier build. So the first possible suspect was Rick Abath, who was actually one of the security guards on patrol. Um, because of his suspicious, suspicious behavior on the night of the theft, while on patrol, Abath briefly opened and closed a side door, a move that some believe could have been a signal to the thieves parked outside. A bath told authorities that he opened and closed doors routinely to ensure they were locked. One of a bath's colleagues told journalists that if a bath had opened the door as routinely as he maintains, supervisors would have noticed him doing so from their computer printouts and stopped the behavior. Suspicion has surrounded the museum's motion detector, which did not detect any movement in the blue room which housed Shea Tortoni during the 81 minutes that the thieves were in the museum. The only footsteps in the room that night were a bath during a security patrol. A security consultant reviewed the motion detector equipment several weeks after the theft and determined they were operating correctly. A bath maintains his innocence and the FBI agent overseeing the case in its early years concluded the guards were too incompetent and foolish to have committed the crime. So then Whitney Bulger. Whitney Bulger one, was one of the most powerful crime bosses in Boston during the era. Heading the 
you determined that Boker's strong ties with the Boston police would explain how the thieves acquired legitimate police uniforms, as perhaps that, or perhaps that real police were arranged to perform the heist. Boker also had ties to the Irish Republican Army, IRA. McShane identified the act of tripping the fire alarm before the heist as a calling card. If the IRA and its rival Ulster Volunteer Force, UVF, both organizations had agents in Boston at the time, and both had previously demonstrated the capability to organize our heist. McShane's investigation of Boker and the IRA did not produce any evidence to um, to tie them to the theft. Okay. So then, in 1994, there was a letter sent to the museum. So in 1994, museum director Anne Hawley received an anonymous letter from someone who claimed to be attempting to negotiate a return of the artwork. The writer explained they were a third party negotiator and did not know the identity of the thieves. They explained that the artwork was stolen to reduce a prison sentence, but as the opportunity has passed, they were no longer a motive. There was no longer a motive to keep the artwork, and they wanted to negotiate a return. The writer explained the artwork was being held in a not in a no common law country under climate control conditions. They wanted immunity for themselves and all others involved and two point six million dollars for the return of the artwork, which would be sent to an offshore bank account at the same time the art was handed over. If the museum was interested in negotiating, they should put print a coded message in the Boston Globe to establish credits. The writer conveyed information only known by the museum and the FBI at the time. So Holly felt this was a strong lead. She contacted the FBI, who then contacted the Globe, and the coded message was printed. On May 1st, 1994, edition of the Boston Globe, Holly received a second offer a few days later in which the writer acknowledged the museums was interested in negotiating, but they had become fearful of what they perceived was a massive investigation by federal and state authorities to determine their identity. The writer explained they needed time to evaluate their options, but Holly never heard from the writer again. So then we have Brian McDevitt. Brian McDevitt was a con, um, a con man from Boston who tried to rob the Hyde Collection in Glen Falls, New York, in 1981. He dressed up as a FedEx driver, carried handcuffs and duct tape, and planned to steal a Rembrandt. He was also known as a flag aficionado and fit the description of the larger robber, except for having red hair. These parallels to the Gardner case fascinated the FBI, so they interviewed him in the late 1990s. McDevitt denied any involvement and refused to take a polygraph desk. Test. The FBI ran his fingerprints and did not match any of those at the crime scene. McDevitt later moved to California and conned his way into tel television and film writing. He died in 2004. So the investigation of the Boston Mafia was quite a long one. So multiple people they investigated in this, so the Merlin No Gang. The FBI had now significant progress in their investigation in March 2013. They reported with a high degree of confidence they identified the thieves, which they believed were members of a criminal organization based in the Mid-Atlantic and New England. They also felt with the same confidence that the artwork was transported to Connecticut and Philadelphia in the years following the theft, with an attempted sale in Philadelphia in 2002. The knowledge of what happened after is limited, and they requested the public's help to locate and return the artwork. In 2015, the FBI stated both thieves were deceased, though the FBI did not publicly identify any individuals. Sources familiar with the investigation said they were associated with a GAN in Dorchester. The GAN was local to the boss, uh, loyal to the Boston Mafia, boss Frank Salem and Ken ran their operation.
operations out of an automobile repair, repair shop run by criminal Carmela Melino. Merlino's associates may have gained knowledge um, of the museum's weaknesses after gangster Louis Royce cased it as early as 1981. He devised plans with an associate to light up smoke.